Hello, I'm Paul from West Country Wanderings and you join me today at the DCLA, the former Devon County Lunatic Asylum. Now, before I continue, I'd like to add a couple of provisos about the content of today's neat vlog. I'm going to do a voiceover and facts and figures on the uh, former Devon County Mental Hospital, or formerly known as the Lunatic Asylum, as a separate piece. Um, this will be form part of the vlog. Uh, I have got some facts and figures with me, but I can't remember all the data um, or the particular years that were involved. So I'll probably do that as uh, subtitles uh, with a bit of background, perhaps with some of the older layouts of the, uh, the buildings here. So I'll be covering some difficult topics today, which are not the normal sort of topics that I cover, which is things like geology, landscape, uh, nature and historical figures. We're actually going to be covering mental health, mental illness, autism and eugenics today. Quite heavy topics and if those topics aren't for you, absolutely fine. The next vlog will be back to my normal topics. Um, it's obviously a personal channel and this is a very personal journey for me and I wanted to share with you the reasons why I've come to, to this location here in Exminster, which is just outside the city of Exeter in Devon. I've just moved away from the, uh, the front of the main entrance to the former uh, Devon County Lunatic Asylum and uh, those words are actually quite shocking to hear them today, but that's what it was called. Um, it opened in the mid 19th century and it didn't I believe close until the latter part of the 1990s had very strong links with the village here in Exminster and I'm currently sat in the former sports ground of the uh, the hospital it had extensive grounds and a very long drive there's been some new housing built in the uh, outside part of it and I'll probably put some photographs up, some little bit of footage, just to show you around the site. Although you can't actually go into the site itself. Uh, this is because the site has now been redeveloped and the formal uh, hospital grounds and the uh, buildings themselves have been turned into private apartments. And as I say, you're not allowed access at all unless you're a resident or a visitor of a resident. You're probably still thinking, why is West Country Wanderings covering a former lunatic asylum on the outskirts of Exeter? Because that's obviously not something that I would normally cover, and you're quite correct. I'm not um, an urban explorer. This site, actually, interestingly, I'll put a link up, has been covered, I think it was about 10 years ago, uh, Urban Explorers, they cover abandoned buildings, uh, derelict buildings, and this was covered about 10 years ago before the site was redeveloped by Devington Homes. Um, as you can see it's been completely redone. It was derelict for quite a few years and they gained access to the site to explore what it looked like after the site had been closed. Uh, so that's quite an interesting view so you can see what it looked like after the site had been abandoned. That's not what I'm covering today. If you have a look at the vlog that I did on B Sands and Hall Sands, you will see there that I briefly touched on my mental health and I also covered the fact that in 2004 I was diagnosed as having autism. Now the reason this has got a connection to uh, mental hospitals is the fact that today in 2021, in April 2021, there are thousands of autistic people in mental hospitals throughout the UK. Uh, the, there are many many reasons for this and I'm going to touch on them. Uh, I say I'm not a, an expert, my only connection to it is that I do struggle with my mental health and I am indeed autistic. Um, but there are some family connections as well um, and I'll, I, I won't mention any names specifically but I do have some experience with family members that have got connections um, in the past actually in the 1990s and that was covered um, by the BBC on their Panorama programme. 
The reason I'm uh, bringing you here today is because of the fact that um, I have actually been uh, done under a Section 136 twice. Uh, now, it's, I think it was about 13, 14 years ago. A Section 136 is basically where the police detain you for your personal safety and uh, m most of the time they do not have any uh, place of safety that they can take you to other than a prison cell and I was indeed uh, having a crisis, um, a mental health crisis, I was having a meltdown, autistic meltdown and uh, because of that I was placed inside a priest's cell. I hadn't actually done anything wrong, I hadn't committed a crime but I was placed in the cell for my own safety and obviously you can imagine a, pl a cell, a police cell is not the best environment. That's my uh, only experience of being inside uh, one of these places like these. I can only imagine the horrors of being inside one of these hospitals, what it would have been like. I've read extensively the medical notes and this hospital has actually been um, extensively historically documented and again I'll put up some links there's a fantastic website which gives you patient case histories of how the patients were admitted what they were admitted with if they were discharged if they died here where they were buried and their family members it, it's a wealth of uh, resource um, but as I say, my main concern is the fact that there are a lot of uh, autistic people in institutions that are open and still in places like these. And the, one of the main reasons for that is due to lack of support through lack of social care. Uh, perhaps they have family that are trying to care for them, but they are unable through resources or issues of their own. And they end up in places like these. And the, the, pro the often the problem is, is once they get inside a mental institution like one of these, it's very, very difficult for them to actually uh, be discharged back into the community uh, because they do not feel, that the authorities, the mental health authorities, do not feel that they will attract the right level of support because obviously there is a lack of social care generally out in the, the wider community. Now, um, there was an issue, uh, particularly around the First World War, with, th with this hospital, when the priority was treating our troops on the front line. And institutions like this one um, were left to rot. A lot of the doctors moved to the front line. The patients were still incarcerated in these hospitals, but they did not receive adequate um, medical treatment. There is an actual fact, there is a brilliant uh, Radio 4 documentary which is still on BBC Sounds, again I'll put a link up to this one, um, which describes in detail what this hospital was like during the First World War and the horrors that it contained. I'll actually expand further on how autism affects me in my daily life, how it has affected me uh, throughout my life to date. Um, we'll actually go down to uh, the Exeter Canal and I'll show you a bit about the canal down there, a little bit of its history and also talk uh, personally about my own experiences with uh, autism and mental health. Um, but before I do that, uh, the other thing I wanted to touch on is the subject of eugenics and a lot of people probably don't understand what eugenics means or how it affects people um, in the day-to-day -day world. A lot of people solely associate it with Nazism but it actually started much before uh, uh, Hitler and the Second World War. Um, incredibly it started with a gentleman called Francis Galton. Um, it was in the mid, again in the mid 19th century when buildings and institutions such as these were being built and Francis Galton was a cousin of Charles Darwin um, who wrote the book Origin of the Species. Francis Galton formulated um, his uh, well theory, hypothesis on eugenics. It actually comes from two Greek words which mean well-born and what he thought was the best thing for the human race was to ensure that only people with what he deemed to be good genes, i.e. people with no health problems, no physical health problems, no mental health problems, who had very high intelligence, were of what he determined good standing, good morals. Uh, they were the people that sh should only be allowed to, to breed and to form future generations. 
Now, uh, again, what seems incredibly to me is this uh, got picked up by lots of quite liberal people, some left-leaning, some socialists, towards the end of the 19th century. Indeed, uh, famous writers like H.G. Uh, Wells, who wrote some of my uh, most uh, favourite books, like The Time Machine and War of the Worlds, he uh, was also uh, an advocate of Francis Galton's uh, theories of eugenics and because of his writings he gave lectures uh, I think down, down in Bromley in, in Kent he gave many lectures and he toured throughout the UK um, expanding on Francis Galton's theories and saying what a great idea uh, it would be to, to formulate these so I, I won't go into the detail in terms of the Nazism, obviously that's been very well documented. Suffice to say that um, there are many, many other things where eugenics has gone on through the history of Europe and indeed elsewhere. Just two examples I can give you, there's many, many more. One is that in Sweden in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, women who fell pregnant Often they went into institutions, often they were sterilised. In fact, they started sterilising women who had uh, stigmatism in their eye because they didn't feel that they should be having children because the, that uh, eye deficit could be passed on to, into their uh, uh, offspring. It also went on to particular races in Sweden and unbelievably, this um, activity in Sweden was supported by the Labour government as late as the 1960s. Yeah, I know that fact just amazes me as well. Um, it's incredible. And the full story of that is still being uncovered. I know the Swedish government are starting compensation for the people in uh, Sweden that were affected by this. Just another example is the, uh, the Roma populations in Eastern Europe, particularly in Bulgaria and Romania whereby particular policies have been done by those governments to reduce the populations of the Roma population throughout Europe uh, in terms of the land that they can access, in terms of healthcare and also education. Obviously th there is an overlap between eugenics and racism um, but it's a personal thing for me because one of the things that I have experienced, continue to experience and have evidence and like a lot of uh, people with autism are learning about is that some charities out there who pretend to look after autistic people's needs uh, are in fact actually looking for a cure for autism uh, which essentially means eradicating people from me, like me from this planet and I'll talk to you more about that uh, when we go down to uh, the canal in Exeter. Construction of a pauper lunatic asylum for the County of Devon commenced in 1842 to the specification of Charles Fowler, a local architect best known for his work at Covent Garden in London. Fowler's design at Exminster acknowledged the faults observed at preceding asylums, most reputedly those of Cornwall and Middlesex County asylums, which were both based upon plans which focused upon one or more observational hubs. By combining the principles of observational convenience for the radial plan with the greater flexibility of a corridor asylum plan, the resultant layout comprised of six blocks radiating from a semicircular linking section. Within the centre of this area stood a central kitchen and the administrative block known as Centre House. At each end of the corridor stood service areas relative to the gender of the population on that side of the asylum. For all of its size and improvements over its predecessors, the asylum outgrew its available space and additions became necessary. These proved difficult to incorporate conveniently into the existing plan and took the form of additional stories over the projecting sections of the semi-circular block and adjacent service buildings. Further extensions resulted in ad hoc extensions to the radial blocks which gradually disfigured the original plan. In 1877 a new chapel by Joseph Neal was added 
by 1889, construction of an annex on higher ground adjacent to the hospital farm had proved necessary. Between 1893 and 1906, this was substantially extended and linked to the rear of the main building and became known as the West Wing. These developments, under successive county surveyors, also incorporated improvements to the main building, including a new laundry and engine house. Bay windows were added to four of the six radiating blocks and the superintendent's residence was relocated from Centre House to the main drive in 1900. In 1932, a substantial new nurses' home was constructed behind the burial ground and a further staff residence, Merthyr, built on the main driveway, both to the designs of county architect Percy Morris. After World War II, Exminster Mental Hospital, along with the other mental hospitals around Exeter, were incorporated into the National Health Service. Developments to integrate services between mental illness services in the Exeter area led to the merger of Exminster, Digby and Wanford house sites as the Exvale Hospital. Long stay and elderly facilities were concentrated at Exminster and Digby, whilst Wanford House, whose grounds provided the site for the new Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital, took on the acute services. In July 1986, the Exminster site was the first of the formal county mental hospitals to close in England under the NHS. The Digby site remained open for another year, after which time the surviving contingent of the ex-Vale Wanford House was absorbed as the psychiatric unit, unit of the Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital. After closure, the hospital remained empty and derelict for many years, resulting in the demolition of most of the later additions and the West Wing. Welcome to part two and welcome to the Exeter Ship Canal. As you can see, it's just there in front of me. Very few ships go up and down the uh, canal here. In that direction, it takes you into Exeter Docks or rather Exeter Quay. And uh, down that way, it takes you out towards the River X and it meets the sea at uh, Exmouth. I've just come round to the Exminster Marshes. It was actually quite busy and a little bit noisy down by the canal itself. Lots of cyclists going past, walkers and boat people. Just needed a little bit of privacy to tell you a little bit more about uh, what we've been discussing in the earlier part of the vlog. Yeah, so this is a fabulous site here. Um, it, I think a lot of it's uh, looked after by the uh, RSPB. Um, and I think the Devon Wildlife Trust also helped maintain it. So there's uh, lots of birders looking out around other sites here binoculars and very long lenses um, at the bird lot. So uh, see, let's, uh, I think actually we got the uh, swallows arrived uh, and we're still in April at the moment. Uh, so that's uh, spectacular early. They're just feeding on the, uh, the uh, midges and flies just on the very, very top surface of the, uh, the water there. As I say, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about uh, my autism diagnosis, how it came about, how it affects me. I've actually struggled with depression since I was uh, 14. I took my GCE early and um, I, because of the extra work involved in that, um, that was two years early before 16, a couple of the subjects were early, I felt a bit overwhelmed with the academic uh, workload and I really, really struggled with that. And I remember going away on holiday uh, after it finished thinking I'll go well, holiday then uh, the feelings of kind of doom and gloom and being anxious about the exam and everything with uh, going on holiday that that would evaporate uh, unfortunately it didn't and when I was on holiday I actually started to feel worse and that was the first time I really felt uh, a sense of a depression and back in the days of when we were looking at the uh, the old uh, lunatic asylum people like that would have been sent hospital um, for what they called in those days melancholia
as I went through my teens, the uh, depression lifted and I managed to uh, do quite well with my uh, what were GCE then, showing my age, obviously GCSEs now, or whatever they're called. Um, yeah, so I, I did okay with them. It, it did evaporate um, and it didn't really present itself to, uh, to me as a problem um, and, until quite later on in the, the 1990s. Um, I, uh, first of all, I started to... Um, I had two jobs initially. I was working in uh, finance and also in uh, as a sales assistant in retail um, that went fine until I started to get into management um, I did quite initially quite well I was promoted very very quickly and towards the end of the 1990s I started to really struggle with the uh, the stress of work and uh, it, it commulted in me having a complete well, in the old term our parlance a nervous breakdown uh, but because of my autism diagnosis, I now re recognise it was actually a complete autistic burnout. I've been over-processing things. I do overthink things. Uh, I like to do things very meticulously. I can't do things quickly. I, I am a hard worker, but I really struggle to do things at a very, very quick pace, uh, particularly mentally. I can't process things well. If you add into that um, personal dynamics at work, the workload, the fact that uh, my staffing budget was cut, but the workload increased. Uh, to cut a long story short, um, I, I just completely um, collapsed with it all. And um, I found things rather difficult. And I, in fact, I was signed off, I think at that time, it was for something like four or five months. I did return to work. Um, and I actually started uh, with a different uh, retailer. Uh, still working in management, uh, I was constantly on antidepressants to try and get me through every single day. Um, initially with the new employer, everything seemed to be fine. It was a nice store, I had good staff around me. Again, budget cuts. Um, again, I struggled. Uh, it, it reached to such an extent where I was having to uh, do the work of several members of staff by sleeping in the store overnight, by stacking the shelves myself. Uh, because obviously working as management you don't pay yourself so I was working unpaid because I didn't have any staff to do I had three members of staff on maternity and that came out of my staffing budget so I had literally had no staff uh, but I, I seemed to be getting visits from head office constantly saying my standards were up to, to scratch even though they knew full well what I needed to do to keep the place afloat again that resulted in a full meltdown episode uh, and I need to tell you this but as I say that the warning is at the start of the vlog that's when I first actually felt truly suicidal I tried to take my own life uh, by cutting myself with scissors and I then saw so cancelling I was off work for 18 months uh, and uh, what basically happened was my employer effectively let me go they didn't wouldn't allow me to return um, but during the course of that I was um, in actual fact, it was two years prior to the peak of my mental health declining that I was diagnosed with having autism. And obviously, it's something that you're born with. It stayed with, stays with you from the day that you're born until the day you die. And we'll come on to how that uh, actually affects me on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes, I struggle with lots of things. Uh, so I currently work uh, in a small supermarket convenience store on the daytime. I used to work night shift. I much prefer doing night shift. In fact, I'll be going back to doing night shift. I current, currently really struggle where I am at work. Um, I have to do some till work, not that much, but I struggle with interacting with customers. Um, although I can do it, I can only do it for short periods of time and it, it causes me to get very, very stressed. I've had many panic attacks of where I've just run out of the store and just either collapsed in my car or sat down somewhere away from work. That's happened quite a few times and it seems to be having increasing frequency. Um, and that's one of the reasons I'm relocating. Uh, it's not the only reason, there's many reasons. And I'm going back to doing uh, night shift, which I find easier because there's next to no customers and you can just get on and do one single job rather than trying to do multiple jobs all at the same time. And that's again, that's something else I struggle with. I also struggle with noise, noise pollution. 
and indeed light pollution. I, f I struggle when it, uh, uh, as you probably saw in a couple of the vlogs, I wear sunglasses a lot because I struggle when it's excessively bright. Sorry, that's a train on the main line between Exeter and Plymouth on the behind me. Um, I struggle with that. I, I struggle with, uh, say, interacting with people. Um, one of my uh, former managers actually asked me, uh, he said, in a nutshell, how, how can you just best describe how your uh, autism makes you different from your colleagues? Because obviously you can't really see that someone's autistic unless they're struggling with something that affects us autistic people. And, and the best example I could give him was that um, I used to go to, when I was a manager, district meetings. And if uh, my manager said to me, right, the next meeting, Paul, I want you to stand up, do a presentation. I want you to talk about for book sales for, the, for, the, for an hour, uh, what departments are doing well, what's not so well, how we can best um, improve our sales in particular lines, what promotions we can do. Now, as long as I'd had time to prepare for that and I got all my facts together, uh, I could quite confidently stand up in a room full of 30, 100 people, wouldn't matter how many people were there. As long as I'd had the practice to do it and I knew what I was talking about, I'd be I would come across as being pretty confident. However, the bit with the district meeting that I really struggled with it was the bit before the meeting started, before the agenda. Everyone arrives a bit earlier. Everyone sat in the room, maybe in a canteen, holding mugs of tea and coffee, eating biscuits. Before that, I'm sure you all can relate to that. That for me is an absolute nightmare. I, I would arrive as absolutely late as I possibly can, but not too late for the meeting. So I'd literally arrive one minute before the meeting arrived and literally sit down um, and look at the, the agenda for the day because the bit before it, interacting with other colleagues, no, no, it, it, it just sends me completely. I don't know when to start talking, when to stop talking, what to talk about, what are the acceptable to topics, what are the not acceptable topics, what's, what's off the agenda, what's on the agenda, how much of my personal life to bring into it, how much of it not to bring into it, and that will just send my brain into a complete well, melt, again, a meltdown is the only way I can describe it. And it would completely ruin the rest of the meeting, so I'd try to avoid it. That's still probably the best explanation that I can give anybody how it affects me. Um, the other thing is, because I've had many meltdowns throughout my uh, working life, I am not the same person I was when I left school. I actually left school and I joined the Royal Air Force as a radar technician. There are aspects of my military life I struggled with and perhaps that's something I could talk with on a different vlog if you're interested in that please let me know and I'll, and I'll talk about my RAF career. There were lots of parts of the RAF that I actually really enjoyed and I excelled in certain areas in, my, in the RAF um, because it was to do with electronics which I enjoyed. Uh, a lot of times working on my own and <laughs> as autistic person that's fantastic and I needed to use my own initiative which um, I, I, you know, I, I feel that I'm, I have a reasonable amount of initiative and uh, drive to get things done on my own. So it was, it was a perfect environment in, in many ways. There are aspects of it I've struggled with. Perhaps that's for another time. I couldn't do it now. I, I, I struggle sometimes to get out of bed in the morning. It's not through laziness. Um, coming to do this today, I struggled this morning. Um, I was hoping to leave earlier. I was thinking, I've been dreading doing this vlog, I know I needed to do it, something I've been wanting to do for a long time, and actually when I first set up the YouTube vlog, the channel, did I want it to become an autistic channel, talking about my autism all the time, or did I want to do something that interests me, which is talking about landscapes, nature, geology, and history, that sort of thing. Well, I decided to do a bit of a hybrid of the two, uh, mainly the main focus of this YouTube channel, as you're probably aware, is to do with highlighting aspects of the, of the West Country, the people think is interesting, but occasionally, and this is one of those times, I will touch on my personal experiences, and perhaps there are some of you out there who are also struggling with your mental health. You, you may, may or may not have autism, but you may struggle with depression or anxiety or both or, or OCD or another type of mental illness and there's no shame in that and I think by talking about these things it helps other people and, and that's why hopefully somebody watching this today may get some benefit from it I don't know but uh, I thought I need to share my experience with you guys so you know a little bit about me so as we go on in the months and hopefully years with this channel you'll understand about why I perhaps do things in a certain way perhaps they're different to how you see things done on other YouTube channels you're thinking why does Paul do it that way because other YouTubers do it a different way? It gives you a little bit of sense of background as to, to why that is the case.
I'll start to wrap this vlog up now. Just a couple of things to, to, to mention before I do. Uh, as I say, I'm, I don't feel like I'm the same person. Well, we're all not the same people we were 30, 40 years ago. But in terms of my mental capacity, I really struggle to, to do things day to day. I have a bit of mind fog. I know a lot of people are talking about that at the moment in terms of long COVID. If they've had COVID, they're just really struggling to process things. I really struggle to do that. <laughs> Tiny example, this morning I needed to get three shirts ironed for my next three shifts at work. I thought I'd done all three shirts and I missed one out. Tiny example, I know, but there's lots of things like that. Printed something I needed to fit a form to fill out and I double printed it so one bit printed over the top of the other. I keep making silly mistakes all the time and I didn't used to do those when I was younger. Maybe that's part of getting older, but I know I do struggle more with, with processing things these days uh, uh, and I find things quite difficult. I can't take on so much. Uh, I used to do loads of things. When I was a manager, I used to run the Chamber of Trade and lots of other things like that. I, I used to say I work part-time and I, I have no capacity to work and beyond that. When I get home from work, I am absolutely completely shot. I, I have to finish the shift by sitting in my car, listening to quiet music for 15 minutes or so before I can even contemplate driving home. Um, and then when I get home, I'm just totally mentally drained. I can't think about doing anything uh, at least for a couple of hours um, I just have to completely wind down because my brain has just been over processing things at work about doing this doing that have I dealt with that customer right have I done this right have I checked the emails doing cash I've been doing in the, in the store as well cash office have I done that right if there was a problem it just wells on my mind and goes over and over again and I can't switch off from it and it ha it just grinds me down so that's why I'm only limited by, by what I can do um, in terms of my, my job now, and I really, really struggle. Um, but I, as I say, I know I'm not the only one, there's many, many people that, that struggle for, for, for various different reasons in the, in the workplace, and the workplaces are getting increasingly more stressful, and everything is, seems to be getting faster, uh, more complex with um, in terms of IT and that sort of thing. Um, and, and, and that leads into to different issues. The other thing I want to talk, touch on is to do with um, suicidal thoughts. Again, I have to stick up a trigger warning. I'll, I'll put another trigger warning up now. Um, but again, I think it's something we need to talk about. Uh, and also in terms of autism, I still do get uh, suicidal thoughts. I keep the numbers of the Samaritans and uh, the SANE line and the Devon emergency line on my phone at all times. I have rang them. I, I do struggle with things and, and that this may come as a surprise to, to people watching this that perhaps know me from other areas of my life. Um, it's, it's a constant. And the other sh quite shocking statistic, which I only found out fairly recently in terms of autistic people, I will check this and I'll, if it's wrong I, I will correct it as a subtitle, but I believe that uh, the average age of death of an autistic person in the UK is 54. I'll repeat that. The average age of death of an autistic person in the UK is 54. I'm currently 57 so I consider myself very very lucky. So I wanted to end this as an upbeat. I have kind of survived the odds that are against me being an autistic person in a neurotypical neuro world and uh, there are many reasons for that. Is one of that uh, a lot of autistic people feel alone. They feel isolated. A lot of autistic people don't work at all. Um, by struggling with their mental health, particularly having had any treatment, they may turn to uh, recreational or, or hard drugs or alcohol or smoking or generally have a poor diet uh, because they've had no other input from anybody else to give them guidelines um, or they've had no support networks around them. All of the above could apply, but it is still a shocking statistic that um, and it's something that makes me feel very uncomfortable about. I will talk about it because I still think we have a very, very long way to go uh, with how we will treat autistic people in this country um, and mental health generally. Um, I think in terms of mental health, things are getting better in terms of how people are now feeling more comfortable talking about their experiences, which is fantastic. There is some more support out there that there didn't used to be. There isn't enough. Uh, but the things are generally better. Uh, but for people with autism and people with learning uh, disabilities, things are not so great. Uh, another uh, statistic I read is that the number of people that had autism and learning disabilities, how many have died with COVID-19? It's far higher than the the, uh, the national population. Um, 
and one of somebody I know on Twitter who has a learning disability, she works for MenCap, she's done a great deal of work in making sure that people uh, with learning disabilities uh, have now received vaccines and she's done some great PR in, in getting that message across to the learning disability community which is absolutely fantastic. So if you're watching this Kiara, I know she's one of my followers, you've done a great job. Um, yeah, so just to sum up really, uh, that's my experience. I say it links in with the history of the hospital that you've seen here in uh, Devon, um, which has an unfortunate history. It was a model institution. It, I, I'm not don't take this from this that everything that the hospital did was bad because that was far from it. It had some successes, a lot of successes. But the point I'm trying to get across is that the institution, society's ways, hamper how mental health is treated in this country and I still think we have a great deal of way to go. I will put some more facts and figures up about the hospital. It is interesting. It's also architecturally interesting. There are some shots from above, which obviously I, I couldn't get to, I couldn't get access to it. I'll put some of those in with some more facts and figures about the hospital. Really love to know what you think about this vlog. I'd love to hear your comments. I really appreciate that. I say, if it's not for you, this, this vlog, that's absolutely fine. My, most of my content is nothing to do with mental health or autism or anything of those subjects. And the next one, the, 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 many of the next ones won't touch on the subject at all. I probably won't come back to it for a little while, but I may touch on it again in the future. But as I say, again, I'd love to know your thoughts. So look after yourselves, take care of yourselves, and I hope to see you all again soon. All the best. Cheers now. Bye-bye.